Welcome back to Beyond the Wrench. My name is Jay Ganinen, and I am your host. Before we get started, I want to mention that Wrenchway is giving away some awesome t-shirts for free when you get seven or more technicians, service advisors, or students to sign up for a free Wrenchway account. There are three different t-shirt designs to choose from, and the more friends you refer, the more t-shirts you win. To learn more, check out the link in the show notes. I will say they are some really cool t-shirts and uh, good quality t-shirts. I've actually uh, tried all three of them and worn all three of them, and they're, they're uh, uh, really, really nice t-shirts. So uh, definitely go check that out. Now, today... I have with me John Fallows, who is the Industry Development Specialist for the School District of Philadelphia. In 2006, John started his career as a theology teacher in South Philly, but then was faced with the the potential of a layoff, so he decided to get more involved in a trade that matched his skill set. After some schooling, he started out as a Ford diesel tech until an injury caused him to revisit education as a department leader at Lincoln Tech. From there, John was honored to move to the school district of Philadelphia to help coordinate and support their automotive and collision programs and to keep the mission of building tomorrow's technicians going. John, a uh, true pleasure to have you on today. How are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me. I'm very happy to be here. I'm excited for this conversation. You've got some interesting perspectives, and I think when reading that bio about you seeing that kind of transition from theology teacher to diesel tech uh, that's a a big swing of the pendulum right there right you're you're kind of going in different directions what was your mindset in doing so what what was it that drew you to uh becoming a a diesel technician so it, it, it's funny yeah we're looking at the beginning of the 2009, 2010 academic year, my second child is born. I'm finding out that they're gonna be closing two arts and high schools in Philadelphia and realizing very quickly, I'm not gonna have anybody under me in seniority when it comes to that. Um, so instead of being laid off, I go to my wife and decide, do we, plan on going back to school and adding a trade to my degree this way. And again, 2008, 2009, we're right in the middle of that recession and the housing bubble and everything that was going on. And a trade seemed like the smart investment. Um, and I was doing side work. I was taking care of my own vehicle because I didn't want to pay someone taking care of my wife's. And I started realizing as I was doing oil changes and brake jobs and diagnostics for really just friends, families, other teachers, I was making as much in a weekend of side work as I was making in a week of teaching. Um, So it kind of was a no brainer from there. If you're going to add a trade, this seems to be one that's not going anywhere and will help provide for that growing family. And so that was kind of the jump and, Ever since I've joked, most of my career has been made by my trade, not by my degree. That is, that is a really cool story. And I I think being able to see that transition, was there anything in that theology side of life that has translated to uh, the technical side or to, uh, to wrenching? I mean, I, I, it's, uh, it's, there's, you see a lot of transition or you'll see other stories like that, but I do have to say this is the first time I've seen a theology teacher make that transition over. Uh, Yeah, my wife jokes that I've taken the most nonlinear path you could. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But, but, you know, it. it, so a a former mentor of mine uh, named Norman Norville, he's passed away now. But um, and he transitioned me through my injury and then going back in education Um, He made a point when I was going through my trade schooling, don't chase the money, take care of people, treat people right, the money comes after that. And I would say that that's probably the the thread where when you look at what the theology teaches you, and it teaches you to slow down, to think about things, to treat people right, and to remember that people come first you realize that's a lot of what makes a success in this industry as well. Boy, is that ever good advice in general? I think looking back to my own path and growing up in this industry, 
that would probably be about the best advice you could get. Don't chase the money and then slow down and think through things. Because I think a lot of young technicians really struggle with that piece. You're, you're constantly, you know, hearing about hours and, and billable hours and making sure that you're getting hours out. And if you're a young tech, you're just not at that point yet, or most young techs Mm -hmm. aren't. So being able to, to take a step back and think through how things work. And, you know, I think that's why so many, so many young techs maybe skip over a schematic is because they're, Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they just want to fix it and get it out. All they hear about is billable hours, billable hours, billable hours. But Mm -hmm. if they actually take a second and actually think through things, they're going to be just a far better technician, at least in my opinion. Oh, absolutely. When I was at Lincoln Tech, my my official title was education supervisor, but very often short of uh, an instructor, so I would sub in and teach a class. And we did a lot of live work. Students engaged in that a little bit more because it meant they got to fix their car. Um, But they would bring their vehicle in and they would laugh because the first five minutes, all I'm doing is sipping my coffee and looking at it. Um, You know, of course, there was all the jokes about, well, this is what the old tech does or whatever. I would explain that on that first five minutes, I was doing the job in my head before I ever touched anything. And that made all the difference to, because you could kind of figure out what are the pitfalls, what could go wrong, what what do I got to pay attention to, instead of just muscle memory through this job. Do you, so as you make that transition, you, you get into a shop, uh, assuming you're liking work, right? You're, you're enjoying repairing trucks or vehicles, whatever it is. Uh, what was it that then shifted you to go to the Lincoln tech side? So, uh, I can still remember the truck. I, I, one day I went out to lunch and everything was fine. And when I came back in from lunch, all of a sudden I noticed that I had no strength in my left arm. I couldn't put the wheel and tire back up on the truck. Um, and so, yeah, I thought it, maybe I just pulled something, had an issue. And then coming back from that the next day, still couldn't hold myself up working on a, a diesel truck. Uh, Ford six liter diesels, any of your listeners who worked on them will know. <laughs> You, you have to kind of put one knee on a battery, one knee on the radiator support, and pull yourself up with one arm. I just realized I, I couldn't do it. So it was a shoulder injury that I looked at. Found out that there was really not anything that was going to get me working quickly enough. Again, I had a second child and growing family. So, uh, I went to the management side for a little bit, did that for about a year. Um, it was the typical case of I left my manager, not my work. Yeah. And, uh, but when I was looking for something, that former mentor of mine had an ad out, called me in and said, uh, you want to come and talk? And we talked for about two hours. Didn't know what I was interviewing for. And at the end of it, he said, well, I need an evening supervisor. It job is yours if you want it. Um, and that's kind of how I jumped back into the education side and kind of putting that automotive and education together. That's a, a great combo. And I think, you know, getting that industry experience, it probably helped you a lot more than if you just would have gone directly into the education side of automotive and diesel, right? Like I, I think having been in a shop gives you a lot of credibility. I think it gives you a lot of understanding that maybe, some teachers don't get because you don't, you know, you don't go through that. It, it, have to assume that was pretty impactful on your career. Oh, absolutely. I mean, when I look back, um, so at Lincoln Tech, that's what made me able to sub classes and jump in. Um, in my current role, it one of the keywords you already put up, Jay, was credibility. Um, if I tell a student, you know, hey. I think you should look at this school or I think you should look at this opportunity. Uh, They've also heard me speak in class and they understand that I know what I'm talking about. Um, We, we have a field and I'm sure you've experienced this. We're skeptics of everybody until we hear they speak our language. Yeah. 
Um, and I find that even with students and teachers, it's still there. And once they realize, oh, well, this, this guy, one of my teachers said it to this way. After he got done listening to me talk to students, he says, well, I knew you were in the field, but I didn't know you really had chops. <laughs> and it was kind of like after that, he, he wanted to actually listen and talk and take suggestions. So it does change the whole conversation. That is incredibly true. I've noticed the same thing in, in my career as well. You know, spending time in a shop definitely helps give you that credibility. Do you, so so walk me through a little bit of what you actually do with the school district of Philadelphia, uh, because you've got a an all-encompassing role. Uh, we just had one of our local chapter meetings, uh, one of which was in Philly, uh, was incredibly impressed with the insight that you brought to that meeting and and so being able to maybe understand what it is that you do at the school uh, will call, uh, help lay kind of the groundwork for the the rest of the podcast here. So give us an idea of what what uh, what you're doing there. Sure. Um, so we have ten programs. Nine of them deal directly with automotive or auto body, uh, spread over five schools. So my role is to primarily support the teachers help them with content, help them with uh, finding resources, learning management systems, but also opportunities for the students. So to try to make the connection between industry, the post-secondary, um, as well as among those teachers between each other, to try to create a community that can actually help these aspiring technicians go through our program, learn what the career is about, hopefully decide that they want to be part of this as a career, and then see the avenue that we can lay out for them directly moving forward and growing this, whether it means they want to do post-secondary or they want to hop right into work. Um, and just kind of bringing that consistency and resources to all the programs. Have you seen a shift there in post-secondary versus going direct to work. Uh, you know, I think there's been a lot of conversation about it in industry. And I think there are varied levels of what, you know, what uh, maybe industry's thoughts are on this. You're seeing, mm -hmm. I think, more uh, dealership groups that are starting their own post-secondary programs or, uh, you know, basically they're doing a better job at bringing them in and training them directly. I do think that has some level of concern for me with the future of some of these tech ed programs, or not tech ed programs, but the automotive and diesel programs at that post-secondary level, uh, because there might be the perception like, hey, we can just take them on ourselves. They'll get paid while they're get, going to school. Or, you know, there there's some different variations of what folks are doing out there. But it does feel like things are changing maybe a little bit and something that these post-secondary programs need to be aware of. You know, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I'm seeing the general attitude that, you know, they're looking at a high school program like the ones in the city of Philadelphia, um, kind of as a vetting area for, is a student interested? That's number one. Do they even want to do automotive? Um, number two, you know, did they show up every day? Did they have a reasonable attitude? Can you speak to to those soft skills elements? Um, because let's face it, that's what the service manager doesn't want to have to take the time to suss out. They can't train somebody to be responsible. But if they can talk to a teacher and they see, okay, well, they're, they're responsible, they're showing up every day, they can take um, a, a little bit of constructive criticism and not lash back out. Well, then a lot of the service managers we work with, I'm seeing them feel like, you know what, there's there's the raw material already. Um, and there's been even a move to trying to, to figure out a way to have internships work because then they'll do exactly what you said, Jay. Well, now that I know I have the raw material, I'm happy with that. I'll bring them in. Um, and we have a student we just got hired at a dealership down the, the road from Swenson. He started... Two weeks ago, he graduates this week. That dealership group already brought him in. 
They kind of tried them for three weeks. They said, as soon as you graduate, you turn your diploma over, we'll give you the laptop to start, start your Ford stars training. Wow. And then if we feel we want to advance you quicker, we'll help you with going to a post-secondary. And, and that's kind of where I'm seeing the thought pattern is, uh, they're making this decision on either I'm going to take the time to train you at home or if I feel I need to advance you quicker, then I'll look for another resource. Did you hear the news? Wrenchway is launching local chapters across the U.S. Wrenchway local chapters bring together the best shops and dealerships with schools, technicians, and other industry professionals with the goal of promoting and improving auto and diesel careers in local communities. Wrenchway's local online communities provide a detailed look at what it's like working at the best shops in the area, an effective way for schools to connect with local shops and dealerships, an engaging forum for members to discuss industry topics, and a fun way to win prizes while helping industry and local schools. Wrenchway local chapters are now available in Charlotte, Dallas, Fort Worth, Denver, Detroit, Houston, Indianapolis, Madison, Milwaukee, the Twin Cities, Philadelphia, Phoenix, Portland, and Raleigh. With more chapters coming soon. Learn more and join Wrenchway.com slash local dash chapters. Link is in the show notes. So you... Uh, you've seen a lot of change in our industry in the period of time you've been in. Right. I, I think that's mm -hmm. one of the, I, I look at my experience again in this industry and how much it's changed, how much it continues to change. And I think it's just going to keep changing as there just aren't enough people to fill all of these jobs. Right. So it, I think it, the, the beauty in it is that it's forced industry to kind of open, you know, take off the blinders, open up our eyes a little bit and see uh, and look for other opportunities. But I'm curious as to what you've seen in your time in industry and in education, uh, what those changes look like in, are they, I mean, does it feel as, as drastic as maybe I, I get the feeling that we're seeing uh, in terms of just general change in perception of, of young people from the industry standpoint? Oh, I, I, absolutely. I would even say the word that comes to mind talking about this today is seismic. It, it really has been a, a seismic change. Um, so one of our strongest partners with the school district of Philadelphia has been the city of Philadelphia Department of Fleet Services. Um, now, from when you and I would have been gotten started in industry, if somebody would have told us this opportunity, not only would we have jumped at it, we would have said anybody leaving it was out of their mind. You know, you're, you're 17, 18 years old. You're starting at about $20 an hour. You're in a fleet setup. So you're not having to go out and buy 20 grand of tools right away. You can kind of get away with the craftsman set from Lowe's and a couple hundred to a thousand dollars. You've got a good setup. Oh, and by the way, you have a full city pension in 15 years. So you're, you're 33 and you essentially can, you have a retirement plan done and set aside. Um, and you're in a union where, quite frankly, once you're a year or two in, your chances of having to be laid off is pretty low. Yeah. I mean, it, I know when I was coming in the industry, if somebody would have laid this out, this would have been, you know, the miracle. <laughs> Nobody gets this. Um, I now have students that are, you know, they're there for a year and they're saying, yeah, but the culture, a, a lot of the same culture items that for years we lived with. And, and I remember just having to tell some students at Lincoln Tech, well, that's the way a shop is. You're the new guy. You're going to get hazed a little. You're going to get the rougher jobs and the stuff nobody wants. And yeah, they're going to pick at you until somebody new gets hired. And, um, I, I want to say young people now coming through, they're not tolerating that. They're looking and going, you know what? I can go to Wendy's and make $15 an hour and I don't need to have all of this. I'll do that if my quality of life is better. And I think that that's one of the things that as an industry, we, 
we're slow to change and realize. Um, and then the other half is from the other side, people outside of our industry, not realizing how much our industry has changed. Right. You know, I talk to parents and they still think the, the days of the grease monkey where you're in a pit eight hours a day, uh, slinging oil and grease. And that's, that's your career. And, you know, they're telling their kids, well, that's, that's fine when you're in high school. That's fine when you're first learning, but you don't want to do that for a career. And then I'm talking, I'm saying, well, no, most of the people who are doing this as a career and moving on, um, if you look at Mercedes Benz or BMW, lab coats are required. I mean, it's, it's a, it's not their father's or grandfather's automotive career anymore. Well, and I think that's a, a really cool piece of what you do is some of that educating, not just the student, but the parent as well, and letting them know that this has advanced a lot. Our industry is is really moving forward. On the other side of that, I thought it was an interesting point that you made that there's no longer the excuse for a shop to say, you know, that's just the way it's always been, right? It, it, the, the shop has always been a rough culture because frankly, people do, and not even just students or entry level people, I think experienced techs as well, or experienced employees period have a bunch of opportunities. And if, if they're just getting razzed every day and you know, I, that's, you know, my experience growing up in a shop was so much fun having the ability to kind of go back and forth at each other. And there was, you know, there was some really, really fun times. There were a lot of times where it kind of went past the line of, you know, being appropriate. And I think that's where you're seeing maybe that shift in culture. And, and honestly, who wants to work in a place that you, you dread going to every day, right? It doesn't matter what kind of job you have. If it's, if it's something that, you know, you're going to go in and just get treated like absolute garbage there's there's why if, if you have all the options in the world why would you put up with it right and if you put yourself in their shoes it doesn't seem like that that hard of a concept to understand you've got to have your culture right or you're not going to have you're not going to keep people working for you no and and i think one of the things that's different is the day of being able to say well i'll throw them an extra dollar or well we'll get them up to flat rate and i'll make sure that they're getting i mean I'll say back from when I was doing, I know break jobs. You want to give me a Friday of break jobs? That's great. I'll get 16 hours in my eight hour day and, <laughs> and it made me happy. Right. But I think that that era of the dollar being the kind of the almighty make it or break it. And I think that you, you hit the nail on the head is because opportunities, you know, I have, I have both former students as well as friends who experience technicians, they've been doing this and, you know, now a facilities management company reaches out to them and says, well, because you're an accomplished auto tech, I know, you know, a little bit of electrical. I know, you know, a little bit of plumbing. I know, you know, um, you know, probably carpentry and we're not going to talk about why you know it from the shop, but we know you probably do. So, you know, here I'll offer you the same pay, but nobody's chasing you about knocking out so many tenths of an hour. You're not having the stress of what happens with a slow day, what happens with, you know, a heavy day. And quite frankly, if you want to take vacation, as long as you give us lead time so we know we got somebody to cover it, nobody's harping on you about what work you could have got done and didn't and Oh, and by the way, we'll train you to move up to management because it's still cheaper to hire somebody with less skills than you and train you to move up. And you're right. They look at that and they go, well, with all these opportunities spread out in front of me, I don't have to put up with the things that were done before. And it makes for a very different, a very different hiring field if you're approaching the students coming out of high school now in five, 10, even 20 years ago. I think this is an excellent time for a shop to distinguish themselves as above the rest with culture. And uh, when you look at maybe the shops in the Philadelphia area that you work with, it, one of the things that I've learned over, over my time in industry has been 
there still are some, some frankly crappy shops, right? There's still some really, really good ones. Uh, but those ones that aren't treating their people right, or do have that miserable culture, those are the ones that are forcing people out of the trade altogether. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something we've got to call out because it's out there. It's an elephant in the room type of thing. I recently had a a shop, and this was a uh, obviously re, uh, remain nameless, but uh, say that they did not want to give their uh, technicians benefits or they didn't want to pay them well because that would give them expendable income to be able to go on vacation and take their families on vacation. I'm like, oh my gosh, we are going backwards. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. How is that still a thing? Like I, I, you know, so when, when we see it out there and I'm interested in your point of view here because it feels like maybe that gap is getting further. Like the, there's some really, really mm -hmm. good shops and, you know, people that, you know, managers and leaders that treat their people really, really well. And then there's the opposite side of it where, you know, they're still screaming and yelling and, and they're still, you know, kind of berating their people. And I think the difference between them is huge. And I think the opportunity for a shop right now to distinguish themselves as that upper tier type of shop mm -hmm there's a there's a huge opportunity to put yourself in that category and i i think that is big so in in the greater philadelphia area walk me through that a little bit do you see kind of the the same variances that we see kind of at the national level absolutely and um so I, one thing i've talked with students about and i've almost told them to be cautious of is when you walk in and you see the shop that clearly just had the complete facelift and remodel my I, I tell students the next question i want you to ask is how long is your average tech here what is their average tenure it's a good question uh, um because um uh, i'm thinking of a particular dealership that i won't name but they they're they're gorgeous i mean they people who don't know our industry look at them and they've turned to me and said oh i want to see students here and that's the it's the first jump reaction and that's what they're building they want that that feeling when you look but when you start kind of trying to get under the edge of it and really kind of see well what's the culture what's the feeling you start realizing that the the general managers care for their service department is what it was 25 years ago well, they're just going to keep churning through and I'll bring in as many guys as I can and whoever sticks, sticks. And it, it's all of that old mentality. Um, on the flip side, I have a, a dealership, the one I was telling you, just down the road from our school here that I'm at today. Um, and they're set up so that as students come through, you know, they want to start building an intern program so that it's a long-term investment. Um, they want to start, you know, they already have it set up for the students that they suggest go to post-secondary. They're doing a $350 a month payment to them once they graduate a post-secondary to help with their loan payoff. Um, so it, it's, and it's just, it's a whole different mentality. And I agree with what you said. It, it's the, the chasm that has developed between those two seems to be only getting wider. Yeah. Um, now, what, one of the classic examples that I see is when I look at setting up intern programs to try to give young men and young ladies an opportunity, um, I have to build it now looking at, again, exactly what we're talking about, what culture are they getting into? And in fact, I've had to change it and only work on building intern programs where I have somebody who wants to build it for a year or two year program. Um, we used to do a lot of five weeks in the summer and I would go in and I could talk to a service manager and they would say, absolutely. I'll train them. I'll, I'll show them. I'll put them with a master technician. Um, and the reality was that as soon as I walked out, they told the student, grab a broom, go to the corner. Don't get hurt. If I have a minute, I'll put you on with somebody and maybe you can practice an oil change. And Jay, you already hit the number one thing that kills me about that. Even more than my job with the district, having worked for the better part of a decade now for our industry, now I have a student who, regardless of what their ability is, 
They leave after five weeks and their immediate response is, if this is what the industry is, I don't want to be part of it. And we, we lose that opportunity for everyone, not just that shop. That is such a killer for our industry as a whole. Uh, you know, we, in a lot of ways, it feels like we've we've got a boat with a bunch of holes in it, right? And we're, we just keep trying to fill the top of the boat, but we still have all these holes on the bottom side of the boat that we, you know, we, we keep losing water, right? Or we keep uh, submerging into uh, into the water. And so much of our industry and fixing this industry, I feel like comes down to that. We've got to shore up you know, those holes and those holes are the culture. Those holes are at some level pay, right? I think there's, you know, pay has really stepped up here, uh, in my opinion, you know, over the past couple of years, but that's another piece of this whole thing, right? When you talk about the internship and, and that pay piece is so big for an entry level person. I think so many shops look at this as a, an expense item, something that, you know, they're going to bring on an intern, and it's going to cost them money because it's going to slow down their master tech or it's going to slow down somebody else. And that's over and above just their starting pay in general. When when you've got, you know, Amazon or whoever paying you know, Walmart, McDonald's, doesn't matter. Like they're paying 15 to 20 bucks an hour starting and we're still fighting that like crazy. And at some level, we just got to wake up and be like, this is our competition. This is what we're fighting against. Uh, our, our, same kind of question as before, but is that something that you see reflected in, in these young people coming in? Is that pay gap for a young person to come into a shop so great that they're just never going to give us a shot? Well, and it's definitely something that we, we run into a problem with in reality, because when you look at it um, and compare it to Amazon or Wendy's or McDonald's, you know, I, I get it. I've been on the other side. I've managed a shop for STS. Um, you know, the average cost for hiring was $10,000. By the time you essentially outlaid the advertising for the position, my time for doing interviewing, slowing down my main tech with training them, I, I get it. I understand that it's a cost, and I know most shops ride on a very razor-thin margin. Um, I mean, I... I still one of my best teaching things for students was the margin on selling a set of Michelins. They see a customer walk out with an RO of $900 or $1,000. So yeah, as a shop, you know how much money I made? 10 bucks per tire. That's, that's what, <laughs> that's what I actually made in profit. Um, so I get it, but you know, the problem is we have to think long ball and you competing with Amazon, competing with Wendy's. First of all, just think of what that sounds like. I want to give you a career as a student, but I want to start you at 12 or 13 an hour. Wendy's, it markets themselves as a job that you fit into where your schedule allows. And hey, if you move up, great. If not, it's a survivor job and it gets you through is starting you at 15. So you're, you're having a $3 gap from the gate. And for Wendy's, all you got to do is show up. For ours, for that career, you have had to have gone some degree of skill training. You have to show up. You're, pro you're going to have to buy your own boots. You're going to have to start buying tools. I mean, if you think about it, before the end of week one, Jay, a student that wants to do this as a career is at least in a couple hundred dollars of money out of their own pocket. They haven't gotten one paycheck yet. And they've already been told, get ready to spend another couple thousand before this year is over. The snap on truck is right outside. Um, yeah, it, it, it makes it hard. And this is probably one of the parts where I'll flip the script a little bit and you're talking to a parent. And, you know, you start having that conversation and this is where I've had a lot of service managers, dealer principals in my ear and go, right. But, you know, in four or five years down the road, that when these kids making 17, 18 dollars an hour and your kids making, you know, 60 to 50, 000, you know, somewhere between 50 and 70 thousand if they moved off and did their trainings and everything. That's all great. But for four years 
what that parent just heard is I'm still supporting them. It's still money out of our family's pocket. You're essentially at least two of the four years paying to go to work. You're not even necessarily breaking even yet. And hopefully their child doesn't get frustrated and then take whatever money's already been invested and just say, okay, I'm done. Um, And I think that's one of the areas where you look at and you say that, that fight for pay, if there's not the other things there, you know, do you have a tool budget to help make it a little bit more reasonable to get started? Um, especially when you're going to pair this kid with a master tech and what's he walk into? Well, triple bay, top and bottom box, everything is snap on or Maco. And I've, I've been there, you know, what the master tech tells the kid in the shop, well, you're going to need this tool and you're going to need the, you can borrow mine, but just for this month. So what's the kid see? It's dollar signs and they don't see anything coming in commensurate to that. Um, it, it's that's a hard vision to sell a parent to say that's great hang on for another few more years especially when they don't see what we have built as the sign of success right a degree moving towards white collar if they don't see that as part of it for a lot of families especially inner urban where we still have a large um immigrant population where they might be first or second generation American and they're looking at, I left wherever so that my child could move up. This doesn't sound like moving up. We're pushing hard to get 1,000 schools on Renchway and we need your help. Auto diesel and collision instructors across the country use Renchway to share what's new with their program, build and manage industry relationships, and request resources from shops and dealerships that can help grow their program. Schools can request things like shop tours, tool and equipment donations, advisory committee members, and more. The best part? It's completely free. Know of a school that should be on Wrenchway? Send their information to info at wrenchway.com or tell them to visit wrenchway.com and click on the Four Schools tab to learn more and sign up. Link is in the show notes. I think the accessibility to this too, and you brought up a good point there in terms of uh, the urban communities and being able to, I don't know, appeal to, you know, it feels like there's a lot of opportunity there for us as an industry to appeal uh, to that demographic and some pretty talented people come out of, uh, you know, that demographic as a whole. Uh, I know I've got friends that, are technicians that uh, that came from similar scenarios, and really the only reason they got into the automotive or diesel worlds was because they got exposure to it in, in school. Otherwise, they might not mm-hmm. have even heard of, and not not to say they hadn't heard of it, but really even know what opportunities there mm-hmm. are out there. And you and I have had good conversations before about you know the amount of kids that you know, don't even have a desire to get their driver's license anymore, right? Mm-hmm. Let alone come into our field. How do you see that shift amongst kids and in, in the ability for us to appeal to them if maybe the car isn't what it once was, right? Like it's a, you know, a mode of transportation rather than your, your ticket to freedom, right? I, I think that's the way I looked at it growing up. And I think that's changed with young people. I, I agree. I mean, I think that that's one of the things that we focus on as a challenge. Um, I know my feeling, my feeling even through this year has changed where I've started saying, instead of talking to families about the car, the automobile, it's become, this is one way to learn mechanical aptitude. And it's a great way to pick up that mechanical aptitude. And what does that mean? It means that if you know how to fix a car, you can probably fix your plumbing at home. You can probably, at least when that outlet stops working, you can at least figure out what's going on so the electrician doesn't just sell you a bill of goods. Um, We almost have to equate what else this brings other than just the car. Um, And then, you know, it's funny because accessibility is a good word, J.D., you brought up and something that I thought about. 
um, just a little antidote was I sat back earlier in the year and I was looking, I was going, you know, why our culinary programs are pretty well situated with students wanting to go into them. Um, and I was trying to figure out what, what's the draw because they're not doing any type of outreach that I'm not doing or vice versa. And one of the things that occurred to me was the demographics, when you look at it, a lot of the students who are from immigrant families, from some of these poor neighborhoods, food service is a strong industry for them. Their parents are around a kitchen, you know, and they kind of get taught early on, well, if you work in food service, you won't go hungry. You might have other insecurities, but you won't have that. Wow. Yeah. And and so when you start seeing that, okay, this is what their support systems are exposed to, then the message they're hearing outside of school is that there's a life there, there's some security there. So then it brings up exactly your point. You know, I have some students who the one I was telling you earlier got hired down at the dealership. We got lucky. His dad happened to own a shop and he got exposed to it early and, but he decided he didn't want to have kind of a corner under the radar, not necessarily, you know, legitimate shop. He didn't want to do what his dad did. He wanted to go the dealer world and make a career out of it and, and value that. But I think you know, it's almost, we have to find a way to get the support systems and engaged and realize, A, if the students learn about the automobile, you're learning a lot more than just a car. There's a whole skill set that then comes with that. Um, and let's face it, Jay, something you and I know from being in the industry, the era of the technician being in the back and not dealing with customers is long gone. So you're, you're having to learn customer service skills, even that can value you no matter where you go. And I think if we can build that hook where the, the support systems can start talking positively, then it's not an us versus them. It's not this message when we're in school where we're saying, Hey, this is a cool career and we have a lot we can offer. And by the way, even if after five years, you say, I don't want bloody knuckles anymore. I want to go behind a desk or I want to do this. And we then have the opportunity to say, okay, great. That's still in our industry. We still have that. But if they go home and they hear, yeah, but this industry offers security or that. So uh, I think you're right. I think the era of, well, the car is freedom or the car is cool. I think that's, that's not the message anymore. I think yeah. now it's, it's a lot more of what skills you can take to apply to life beyond just automotive. You hit on something there that I think is really interesting, which is, I think, also a um, a reason why culture is so big is if you go to a Facebook group or you go somewhere and you read experienced text just bashing our industry, right? And some of it rightfully so, uh, that maybe they've been wronged. And some of it is just, I think, noise. And, and there's some folks that are just going to complain just to complain. But, you know, if that's who's influencing a young person when they come into our shops and you have that young person coming in and your really good experience tech telling them to, to get out as fast as they can, which is a story I hear over and over and over again, you know, that again is one of those holes in the boat that we've got to shore up. You know, we've got to treat our people well enough so that they're not telling our young people to, to run for the, <laughs> run for the fences, right? We, 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 we need to take care of our experienced, really good techs because, uh, we want them. And I think we need them uh, bragging to their friends that, Hey, I'm a tech. Like I, I know how to fix stuff. I know how to do things that other people don't. And, if if it's perceived that we're not treating them right and then they go out and tell a young person that you know this isn't a good career again it's one of those it's one of those scenarios where we just continually shoot ourselves in the foot over and over and over again no you're right i mean nobody has more credibility to a teenager than another teenager right yeah. um 
So, you know, one of the things that I think is important and on both sides, it's, it's in the school side as well as in the shop side is to your point, you have to be very careful about who you're exposing the students to. Um, personal story. My, my son is down in Tennessee uh, doing auto body and he actually just got hired at a, a second shop. So the first shop he was hired at did um, tanker trucks and larger things. And I mean, they help pay a relocation bonus. And when you look on the surface, it's got everything we've just been talking about, right? But the person they paired him with for kind of mentoring, training, learning the ropes, getting in, um, they picked based on the skill level with sanding, painting, prep. Uh, and so every time, you know, if my son was slowing him down, it was, oh, well, go sit down. I'll, I'll call you when I need you. Or it was that same type of message. This industry will beat you up. Get out while you can. It, it was that. So every time I was talking with my son, he obviously was not feeling excited about work at all, right? Um, so he went through some other things. He, he took some time, about six months away from the industry, uh, was working at a grocery store actually. And then things happened there and he just found the position at this hole in the wall, um, body shop. It's got Econo in the name, Jay. I mean, that's, <laughs> um, but I mean, and I was talking to him on the phone. And he said, yeah, the only thing is they don't fix any of the holes in the wall. I don't know why. I went, well, the condo's in the name. Um, so uh, on the surface now, it's missing everything we just said is important, right? But the culture, the who he's exposed to, the fact that the manager isn't riding him every day, and it's like, hey, I want you to be up to where you can be sanding, you know, 10 cars a day, but I'm not expecting you there now. I know you're going to work up to that. You know, it's kind of like the parts that you need to bring. Are you going to show up every day? Or are you going to be reliable? Yeah, I'm, I'm here for that. Good. Matt, he's like, I really need a, you know, a DA. The manager's like, all right, I'll pick one up for you. Like, it, it and so things. now, yeah, and it, it's that excitement is there here. So, it shows how much the cover can be deceiving and who we expose them to, who we connect them with. Um, I see it even with the internship programs. If they don't have a team lead that's set up, you know, if they're worried about how many hours they're going to bill out and they're not worried about what am I doing to get this young person in so that, I'm not having to do all the oil changes every day and they want to be here. It, it makes a massive difference. It It is interesting. And I think that's something it, it, I want to touch on the internship program again, because I think this kind of brings things full circle in that you can create as a shop, a lot of what we are talking about by having some structure around an internship mm -hmm. program and making sure that, you know, there, I think at some level, they're still going to be pushing a broom. They're still going to be, you know, you, you, you have to learn the basics of, you know, maintaining a space and that kind of thing. But, you know, the days of pushing them out in the shop and saying, good luck, uh, grab that broom and don't get hurt, I, I think are, you know, hopefully changing. But uh, that structure around an internship program, I think, can be so impactful for not only the young person, but for the shop itself, just to have you know, the chaos organized and, and, you know, the loose ends tied up, because if you can put some thought into it up front and have a good program, I'm guessing you're going to have more success with an internship program as a whole. Absolutely. I mean, a, a big part of, so the internships, when I inherited the program were the same model that had run for about 20 years. Um, there were kind of two general models. There were the five weeks over the summer. And then there was uh, a larger program, but it was only a couple of hours every night after school. And then they would do full time during, uh, during the summers. Both of those had the drawback that really, when you think about it, there's not enough time available to do the, the structure you're talking about, Jay. So, you know, 
five weeks over the summer. And again, I'll flip the script. I remember being a service manager. Um, you pull in a new guy. They're, they're the first hire. You're going to get him in the shop. I'm spending a week just getting through whatever the corporate training is, right? Sit down at the computer, get through OSHA, get through. So one week's already gone. Okay, so now I got four weeks. Well, another week minimally, and that's assuming they're a fast learner, is just going to be here's where cars come in, here's where they go out, and here's how things flow. And this is kind of where and how people spend their time. So at most, I would have three weeks with them. And that's barely enough that they start getting to see what the rhythm of the environment's like, right? So from a service manager's perspective, I get it. Five weeks, you're thinking by the time this kid has actually learned anything, I'm losing them. Um, and the flip side is our other program, which was with Department of Police Services, where they were only coming at night after school. You know, it had the drawback that, first of all, we're your most experienced techs. They're on your first shift, not your second. So who are the guys who have learned the most, probably have the most patience, and quite frankly, have the most tools in their toolkit, both figuratively and literally? That's your first shift, your most experienced techs. Well, we're bringing students in on a second shift. Those are the people who are racing to try to make their living. And they haven't necessarily learned all the tricks and they haven't absorbed that environment all the way and that culture you want to build. Plus, bring in the parent part of it, traveling inner city on public transit when it's dark for two thirds of that academic year. Doesn't do anything to encourage a parent. So we, we took it and we flipped it and said, okay, what we'll do is we'll release them from class on Friday. They will get a full day Friday and a full day Saturday. So now you're getting 16 hours back to back with them. And that does give that time to structure. And so now you're seeing a student in your environment for a full work day, anywhere from two days to a full week during the summer. And they get to stay in that same environment for anywhere from one to three years, depending on the partner we set the program up. That's a really a good chance where if you sit back at the table with me and say, for two years, we've tried to get this student to really absorb our culture and they don't seem to be getting it. Well, you know what? No harm, no foul on the dealership part then. You've done your part. And then it's a conversation with the student if they really want this as a career field. And chances are they probably know really well now because it's not, it's very easy to say, yeah, I love working on cars when you spend two hours a day and maybe you touch a lug nut, <laughs> you know, you spend, eight, you spend eight hours and you come home covered in grease and you still say, yeah, I want to do this tomorrow. Well, there's a much higher likelihood that yeah, you, you probably really do want to go in this direction. I think there's a lot of positive impact on, a student finding out that this isn't for them too, before they go and spend a bunch of money on schooling or, you know, whatever it is. I, I still have a lot of friends that went, you know, went to these big programs, spent a lot of money at these programs, lasted six months, and then were out of the industry altogether. And in reality, I think if you looked at them and had a nice conversation with them up front, and I, you know, I went to, I went to a big school too, right? A, a big tech school. And the amount of people that were in my class that you were like, Man, there's just no way that this is for you, right? Like it was alarming. And I feel bad for those people, right? Because they went in and spent a lot of money. And I think it was just to check the box of going to school rather than actually having something really an understanding of what they're getting themselves into. So getting exposure to a young person you know, while that, you know, if that student doesn't stay with you and they, they leave might be as good as it, like it, it, not as good as if they were great and they wanted to stay, but at least you're not trying to, you know, put them into training and trying to get them to love the job. You know, if they're just not going to like it or they're not going to be good at it, there's probably something else out there that they are going to be good at it. So hopefully you put them on their path to get to what it is mm -hmm. that they, that they will love. But, you know, I, I, I always have felt bad for those folks that go in and spend a bunch of money on school 
and then don't get anything out of it. Uh, you know, I, I think that that is a huge harm, uh, not only to our industry, but to every industry, uh, to, to send a student in and accumulate a bunch of debt only to find out. And not only just the school side, how, how often do you go on Facebook marketplace or Craigslist and see, you know, a younger tech selling their tools for pennies on the dollar. And again, just wasted resources for that young person. So I think the impact you could have on a young person's life simply by letting them know that this isn't for them uh, is a huge, huge positive as well. Yep. And I'll, it actually brings it right back to your first question which was um, when we look at kind of the change and I've been referencing a particular dealership a lot because I've looked at what they've done the last year and they're, I think doing it right in the sense that, yes, they're looking at high school students. They're coming out. First of all, they're not trying to pull 10, 15, 20 students and just see who works. They're saying, you know, let's really tailor and pull two or three students. And then in working with them, they're suggesting to those students, hey, maybe you should go and go to post-secondary and advance this because we see the potential. We already see you want to do this. And I think it it does a lot of the things that we've talked about today, which is it does build a culture because the student knows, you know what, this employer stood behind me. They backed me. Um, it sells it to the other students in the program. I had three other students come up to me in the last two weeks wanting to ask about how they can get a career in this field. And they were kind of, you know, lackadaisical. They were in the class, they were in automotive, but they stopped me because they knew I had helped this one student get in with the dealership and they had seen how he was. So he starts talking positively. Now all of a sudden it's, ooh, junior year's ending. Senior year's about to roll around. Maybe I should start thinking about what the career in this looks like. And we can start building some forward momentum where the students who don't want to do it, like you said, realize, you know what, maybe I should start looking at somewhere else now. But the students who do want to do it start looking at what are the resources to really get committed into this. And you'll find that the partners who have the right attitude about that are already set up to go down that same road with them. Do you this is a funny thing, not funny, but a real thing. Uh, I've noticed is that there are far more people giving in industry, people giving scholarships to folks going into the skilled trades. And uh, I had helped get something set up in uh, local in my hometown where we did a car show and the proceeds went to giving a scholarship to uh, a high school senior going into the skilled trades literally did not have one person apply for the scholarship, even though I, from what I had heard, 50% of that class is doing something with a, a technical school. Right. And I don't know why that is, but I've heard from others uh, my, my business partner, Mark, he did the same thing in his hometown, had nobody apply for the scholarship. And you're like, this is, this is free money towards your education here. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know if that's a consistent thing around the industry or not, but I look at it and I'm like, I, I don't know if they've conditioned themselves so much to say, Hey, I'm not, you know, either not a good student or I don't, I wouldn't qualify for those because of my transcripts and, you know, maybe my grades aren't the greatest in one area. Uh, but there really was no, there was no, <laughs> no, uh, boundaries to who could apply to this and to have nobody apply to it, it just absolutely blows my mind. And I don't know if that's something we've just got to change, uh, again, going back to the paradigm shift, maybe change their thinking to say, hey, you know what? You are talented. You are in demand. And here's some money to help you towards your education. I'm I, uh, uh, curious to, to hear if, if you've seen anything like that or if uh, if that's an isolated issue with, with us. No, 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 it's not isolated. I mean, we we have um, we have the Auto Dealer Association's Tech Comp, which is probably the single largest gathering of scholarships given to automotive students in our area. But even that, I don't know. I don't know if you build it as, oh, this is a way to get scholarships versus this is a way to compete against other students and kind of show what you know, you would get the same participation. I think, you know, I do think that there's still a stigma, for lack of a better word, that if you're in 
not just a trades program, but I'm going to very specifically say the hard trades, auto, auto body, electrical, plumbing. You're there because you know what? Little Jimmy, little Johnny, little Susie, they don't, they're just not academically strong, but they'll be real good with their hands. And, and I think we still have a stigma about that. And I think um, I just sat on a, a post-secondary school scholarship board. So they had 10 scholarships to offer. They had nine students come in. So one scholarship is already not going. Every student's getting something. You're really just choosing between the one full, the one half, and the remainders that go out. Um, but you can see that, you know, one student outright told us in the interview, well, my family said I, that we, I'd never be able to afford to go to a college or anything anyway. So if I'm going to get any money for school, this is the only way it's going to happen. So there, there is a message being played. And I think you're right. It's that paradigm shift. Um, and it's a paradigm shift that has to happen in the schools. It has to happen with the support system for these students. But okay, I'm going to tell you outright, I've done education long enough. This is one that the schools can't do alone um, because it's going to be, it, I, I liken it to this. When mom and dad tell you, you know, don't touch the hot stove. Well, it's mom and dad. What do they know? Uh, my 21 year old son, I give him advice, do X, Y, and Z. Okay, dad. And then he does the opposite. <laughs> dad said, right. So, <clears throat> you know, but there's a difference when somebody outside the scenario. So when the school is saying, whether it's the Philly school district or it's a post-secondary that I've worked for, when they say, no, it's academics, it's just a different type of academics because the industry has changed. You still are doing a lot of analytical thinking. You still are doing a lot of reasoning. You're just tying that with, muscle memory and mechanical aptitude um, because knowing how to turn a screwdriver doesn't mean anything if you don't know what leverage is and the physics behind it, right? But I think us saying that to a parent, us saying that to a student, it kind of becomes like, okay, yeah, but you have a program to fill, right? So, right. And then that's where I think we need the help from industry to be involved and understand that, if we don't start getting that message and paradigm shift out on the middle school level and the young high school, I'm talking ninth grade, by the time they're in 11th and 12th and I have a service manager saying, well, what students do you have for me? I have five programs. I'm lucky if I have 30 graduates. And that's, that's a true number, Jay, for five automotive programs across the city of Philadelphia, 30 students graduating. And maybe half of them are really interested in doing this as a career. So you wonder why we only have 15? Because we didn't get the message out to them before they ever set foot in my program. Boy, is that a good point. And that is one that I hope we scream from the mountaintops. In order to get more people in, we've got to fill that pipeline. We've got to work together as an industry and drive that interest, drive that interest in the program so that there's not the threat of those programs getting cut We've got to get more, you know, more students out of these programs. I think we're making a lot of progress. So much of what you do is driving that progress. And, and uh, I just really, really hope you, you stay as passionate and as driven as you have been with this because you're a, you're a definite asset to our industry and uh, really, really happy to have gotten to know you and, and learn about your program out there because you're doing a fantastic job. So thank you so much for joining the show today. Thank you, Jay. Thank you for having me. That wraps up this week's episode of Beyond the Wrench. Be sure to tune in next week for another brand new episode. As a reminder, don't forget to rate and follow Beyond the Wrench on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps us get Beyond the Wrench in front of other fantastic shop owners, managers, technicians, and dealers just like you, so we can continue to help improve, promote, and grow this amazing industry. Thanks everyone for listening, and we'll be back next week. 